my paper looks at the influence of Charles Saunders Peirce on Gilles Deleuze, particularly the link between Peirce's concept of the diagram and Deleuze's view of analogue art from his book Francis Bacon, The Logic of Sensation. The paper has three sections. The first acts as an introduction. It outlines Peirce's semiotic theory and how it is revised and used by Deleuze in his books Cinema I and Cinema II. The second examines how Peirce and Deleuze use the concept of the diagram. The third section discusses the links between Peirce and Deleuze in a broader metaphysical context, particularly their treatment of chance and chaos. So section one, Peirce's theory of signs. By way of an introduction, I begin by looking at Peirce's theory of signs and how it has been used by Deleuze. In his 1981 book on Francis Bacon, Deleuze uses a revised and expanded version of Peirce's semiotic theory. He also uses it extensively in his two later books on cinema, where he explains Peirce's theory of signs in some detail. So this is my starting point. In Cinema I and Cinema II, Deleuze outlines Peirce's fundamental categories of being, firstness, secondness, and thirdness, what Peirce calls the Seno-Pythagorean categories. Firstness is that which is, such as it is, regardless of anything else. It, in other words, without reference to anything else, a monadic state or a quality. Secondness is relative to something else. It is existence or actuality or brute fact involving action and reaction. It corresponds to the idea of secondness in logic. It is dyadic. Thirdness is the category of mediation between first and second. Signs are used in this process of mediation which necessarily involves representation. A sign must represent something to an interpreter. And we can see how the relationship between object, sign, and interpretant, the, the latter is Peirce's term, are based on this process in the three semi-Pythagorean categories. So it's this which forms the basis, the core of Peirce's semiotic theory, the triad of the elements of semiosis. So let me give you some examples. A is red, is an example of firstness. A collides with B is secondness and A gives B to C is thirdness, and everything, according to Peirce, can be reduced to these categories. Note that thirdness can't be reduced to either firstness or secondness. We can't, in my example, A gives B to C, reduce it to, to A puts B down and C picks B up, two separate examples of secondness. In doing so, we've lost the act of giving, the intentionality, and it's this which forms the basis of representation. So for Peirce, thirdness is a synonym for representation. We are representational beings. We are, in fact, signs. According to Peirce, quote, if we seek the light of external facts, the only cases of thought which we can find are of thoughts in signs, end quote. In the two cinema books, Deleuze explains the basis of Peirce's taxonomy of signs, they are either icons, indexes, or symbols, depending on their relation to their object. Peirce's taxonomy of signs leads Deleuze to identify three kinds of image, the affection image, the action image, and the relation image. And again, we can easily see how they relate to the three categories. In anticipation, I need to mention that the icon represents its object by a relation of resemblance. Now, the word relation is important there, and I'll return to the point shortly. I want to move on to where Deleuze disagrees with Peirce. Deleuze understands that Peirce accepts these three types of images or signs as given, as a starting point. Deleuze believes that they require further deduction. He believes the three types of image in Peirce's system assume a movement image, which itself must be deduced. In other words, the three types of image are related to an interval of movement, which must be accounted for. So the beginning of the process for Deleuze is the perception image, what he calls degree zero in perception. So this consideration adds to Peirce's original three types of image and gives rise to six types of signs in Deleuze's system. The three from Peirce, 
plus degree zero, our starting point, and two intermediate types. So we have now perception image, affection image, impulse image, which is the first intermediate, action image, reflection image, the second intermediate, and relation image. Now Peirce, of course, also expands his own taxonomy of signs to give 28 classes, or if you take Erwin Leeds' view, 66. So although Deleuze accepts the importance of Peirce's approach in some of his tax taxonomy and nomenclature, he does have a significantly different view of signs. Section 2, Peirce and Deleuze on the diagram. In his book on Francis Bacon, Deleuze introduces the concept of the diagram, and it has a crucial role in creativity. It's the way, as Pan has just mentioned, of destroying the, the cliché inherent in painting, what is lodged virtually on the canvas even before work starts. And his concept of the diagram is based on Peirce's idea of the diagram as a special and powerful class of icon, which, as I've pointed out, bears a relational similarity to its object. I'll mention one aspect of the diagram. Again, the idea comes from Peirce, which plays an important part in Deleuze's treatment of Bacon. That's the diagram as an analog device. And for analog, of course, we can read relational. Peirce says, quote, a diagram, though it will ordinarily, ordinarily have symbolized features as well as features approaching the nature of indices, is nevertheless, in the main, an icon of the forms of relations in, in the constitution of its object. Deleuze takes us up to examine the difference between analog diagrams and digital codes. The nature of the diagram is such that it is related to its object in an analog manner, which relies on continuous modulation rather than the form of a symbolic code, a code which is based, for example, on some separate system of integral units. Deleuze uses integral in its mathematical sense, referring to integers leading to digital or binary codes. He explains this integral code necessarily requires translation and reconstitution in its operation, and he attempts to explain the distinction between analog and integral devices by referring to analog and digital synthesizers. He refers to analog synthesizers as modular devices, and early devices were indeed modular. The technology of the time meant that patch cables were needed to implement individual signal flows. And this was true until about 1970 when Robert Moog produced the, a workable non-modular or integrated synthesizer. However, the reference to modular synthesizers is confusing. The key feature of analog devices is that they use a continually modulating signal rather than a digitized or codified signal. The better term for the analog synthesizer would be modulatory, not modular. A better example to explain the difference between analog and digital devices, although it was barely available to the Lurs in 1981, is to compare the vinyl record player, an analog device, with the CD player, which is digital. Deleuze compares the attributes of digital and analog processes, but also identifies how they can be interrelated. For example, he believes we can do three things with codes. Firstly, we can simply combine abstract elements. Secondly, we can send a message which will have an isomorphic relationship relation to the original reference, in other words, look like it. And thirdly, we can reproduce extrinsic elements using intrinsic elements of the code. Returning to the example of the synthesizers, today the situation is much more complex. Digital signal processing technology allows digital processes to emulate analog filters in things like virtual studio software. Deleuze goes on to explain two types of analogical resemblance. Firstly, resemblance in the producer, as in a photograph. And secondly, resemblance in the product, which emerges as the primary result of non-resembling means, or in his words, as the brutal product of non-resembling means. He calls this second analogical resemblance aesthetic analogy. And this includes the analog art par excellence painting. He distinguishes three types of painting. Firstly, abstract art, 
although he does not refer to it directly, it's pretty clear that he means hard edge abstraction, which employs the analog technique of painting to emulate codified representations using what he calls implicit binarization. And secondly, lyrical abstraction, the type of nonlinear abstract art which relies on the cultivation of the unconscious, of spontaneity, and the manipulation of the material itself. And thirdly, the middle way, painting which uses the diagram to constitute its analogical language. Now the diagram, I must emphasize, has an important role in Peirce's philosophy. He sees the diagram as the basis of how we think. He goes on to expand this using diagrams in his own logical system, in his existential graphs, and to explain physical events such as force and acceleration. In a similar way, as we have just seen, Deleuze sees painting using the diagram as its method, and as such, he sees it as the supreme analog art. It is the, quote, form through which analogy becomes a language by passing through a diagram. And it's important to note the power of the diagram here. For Peirce, the parallelogram of forces, for example, a diagram does not describe force, it is one with force. It operates as force does. The same with painting for Deleuze. The diagram does not describe painting, it is how painting takes place. If Peirce sees the diagram as the way we represent through thinking and language, Deleuze sees the diagram as the way painting becomes language through representation. Felix Gattari, in his last book, Chaosmosis, successfully highlights the far-reaching implications of Peirce's concept of the diagram. It, quote, is conceived as an autopoietic machine which not only gives it a functional and material consistency, but requires it to deploy its diverse register of alterity, freeing it from an identity locked into simple structural relations. Gattari's argument links two threads. First, Maturana's and Varela's concept of autopoietic systems, those which exhibit self-organizing and self-regulatory tendencies, systems which are seen by them as underlying all cognition. And secondly, Peirce's view of the diagram, which, as I have already explained, he sees as the basic mechanism of how we think. Section 3, Chance and Accident in Person and Deleuze. Another aspect of Peirce's work I wish to refer to briefly is the important place of chance in his metaphysics and how this relates to Deleuze's view of accident and chaos. Deleuze gives no acknowledgement of any influence by Peirce in this area, but the similarity of approach is, is striking, as I, I hope to show. I'll explain Peirce's metaphysical system very briefly, but I should point out that his system was never fully completed and is far from comprehensive. Before I begin, I need to indicate Deleuze's view of the role of chance in painting. In Francis Bacon, he explains the introduction of chance or accident into the history of Western painting through Christian art and why he believes this introduction is so important, particularly, as we shall see, in Bacon's painting. The argument, which I don't have time to explain here, follows the, the progression in the history of painting from essence to event, it's that change which allows accident or chance to be incorporated into painting. I will now very sketchily outline the role of chance in Peirce's metaphysics. I've already identified Peirce's three fundamental categories, firstness, secondness, and thirdness. Peirce regards the first quality as providing a permanent possibility of sensation. The second gives us actuality, and the third destiny governing future facts. This leads us from the three fundamental ontological categories to three corresponding modes of being. Peirce distinguishes these as three categories of existence or actuality. They are chance, law and habit taking. Peirce's cosmology sees the beginning of the universe on one hand as absolute indetermination, the negation of all determination. 
and on the other hand as the real possibility of any or indeed all determination. Chance is seen as spontaneity and creativity. It annuls itself as unlimited potentiality by taking the form of the possibility of firstness or suchness, and this moves through secondness in habit-taking and thirdness in the form of law. The reign of law opposes chance. But the limits of that process are always an abstraction because chance is always operating in the world through Peirce's concept of tychism or chancism. So Peirce sees, the evolution, sees evolution as a process of advance from absolute chance considered as a chaos of unpersonalized feelings to the reign of pure reason embodied in a rational system. Without going into detail, Peirce adds two more cosmological categories to explain this process. To his category of tychism, he adds firstly agapism and secondly cynicism. The agapism adds the concept of the cosmic significance of love. This is also the area where aesthetics becomes important for Peirce. It follows from the idea of artist play or amusement, which he developed from his early study of Ferdinand Schiller. This leads Peirce to identify three normative sciences, logic, ethics, and aesthetics. He believes that logic is subservient to ethics and ethics to aesthetics. In other words, all logical and, and ethical decisions are in fact aesthetic. His concept of cynicism embodies the doctrine that everything is continuous, a form of vitalism which derives from his logical system. Compare this with Deleuze's view of chance operating in painting. Quote, if we consider a canvas before the painter begins working, all places on it seem to be equivalent. They are all equally probable. End quote. With the initial view of what she wishes to produce, the painter identifies unequal possibilities, which are the beginning of the process of painting. Three marks. These marks are in one way accidental and in another way determined by the action of painting. Deleuze explains that the marks are, quote, accidental by chance, but clearly the same word chance no longer designates probabilities, but now designates a type of choice or action without probability, end quote. It is now manipulated chance, which plays such an important part in Bacon's process of painting, scrubbing free marks, throwing paint at the canvas. In the final chapter of Deleuze and Guattari's What is Philosophy, we are given a broader perspective on chance and accident. They feature in the form of chaos as one of the foundations of their metaphysical system. Quote, chaos has three daughters. These are the chaos, art, science, and philosophy as forms of thought or creation. I'm conscious in the time available I've compressed quite intricate arguments. I've explained Deleuze's indebtedness to Peirce's theory of science and his view of it on the diagram, chance and chaos. I've also tried to show how Deleuze's book, Francis Bacon, develops these concepts and goes some way towards explaining the unique power and fascination of Painter's work. Deleuze ends his book, quote, it is as if the duality of the tactile and the optical was surpassed visually in this haptic function born of the diagram, end quote. But perhaps the last word should go to Bacon himself, talking about his method of painting. Quote, I use very large brushes, and in the way I work, I don't in fact know very often what the paint will do, and it does many things which are very much better than I could make it do. Is that an accident? Perhaps one could say it's not an accident because it becomes a selective process which part of this accident chooses to preserve. One is attempting, of course, to keep the vitality of the accident and yet preserve a continuity." End quote. Deleuze and Gattari point out that the diagram plays a fundamental or what they call piloting role in the process of creativity. Quote, the diagrammatic or abstract machine constructs a real that is yet to come, a new type of reality. End quote. 
So let me end by summarising these links between person and Deleuze. Both are concerned with process or becoming. Manuel de Landa characterises Deleuze as a process realist, and Peirce identifies himself as a semiotic realist. For Peirce, as I have already explained, semiosis is a process. Both of them are anti-essentialists. Both accept, on the one hand, the role of chance or chaos in the universe, and on the other hand, see the diagram as an autopoietic machine, self-generating and self-regulating. The diagram is an integral feature of how we think and how we create. One final quotation. Quote, Philosophy must constitute itself as a theory of what we are doing, not as a theory of what there is. End quote. Now that could easily be from Peirce's Harvard lectures on pragmatism. It is in fact the final sentence from Deleuze's great essay on David Hume, Empiricism and Subjectivity. And I'd suggest that the difficulty in deciding the author here reflects their closeness. Thank you. three sections. The first acts as an introduction. It outlines Peirce's semiotic theory and how it is revised and used by Deleuze in his books Cinema 1 and Cinema 2. The second examines how Peirce and Deleuze use the concept of the diagram. The third section discusses the links between Peirce and Deleuze in a broader metaphysical context, particularly their treatment of chance and chaos. So section one, Peirce's theory of signs. By way of an introduction, I begin by looking at Peirce's theory of signs and how it has been used by Deleuze. In his 1981 book on Francis Bacon, Deleuze uses a revised and expanded version of Peirce's semiotic theory. He also uses it extensively in his two later books on cinema, where he explains Peirce's theory of signs in some detail. So this is my starting point. In Cinema 1 and Cinema 2, Deleuze outlines Peirce's fundamental categories of being. First, My paper looks at the influence of Charles Saunders Peirce on Gilles Deleuze, particularly the link between Peirce's concept of the diagram and Deleuze's view of analog art from his book Francis Bacon, The Logic of Sensation. Thirdness is the category of mediation between first and second. Signs are used in this process of mediation which necessarily involves representation. A sign must represent something to an interpreter. And we can see how the relationship between object, sign and interpretant that the latter is Peirce's term, are based on this process in the three Senate Pythagorean categories. So it's this which forms the basis, the core of Peirce's semiotic theory, the triad of the elements of semiosis. So that's secondness and thirdness, what Peirce calls the Senopythagorean categories. Firstness is that which is, such as it is, regardless of anything else. It, in other words, without reference to anything else, a monadic state or a quality. Secondness is relative to something else. It is existence or actuality or brute fact involving action and reaction. It corresponds to the idea of secondness in logic. It is dyadic.